Today, we are going to be dealing with Keith Marlowe of Calgary, Alberta, an attorney at Blake's Law Firm. Keith is a lawyer acting on behalf of Capital One. So today, we're going to go over all of the techniques that bank lawyers use to try and cast doubt upon their adversaries, and then exactly what they do when those techniques don't work. Now, the reason that bank lawyers get paid so much is because they have to help banks commit fraud. They have to break rules, and they have to get dirty. The opening correspondence is very simple. We just let Keith know that we're reaching out on behalf of the plaintiff, and we draw his attention to the assignment clause within the Capital One cardholder agreement that states, we may at any time sell, transfer, or assign any of all our rights and obligations under this agreement without telling you in advance. And we then point out that obviously it would be very unreasonable to expect payment for an asset which may have been sold. Then we just simply let him know that we're just requesting proof of ownership since Capital One states very explicitly in the cardholder agreement that they can sell it at any time without telling the plaintiff then we'd just like some verification that the debt had not been sold. We then point out that an affidavit would be necessary due to the Supreme Court of Canada rules of court, where an affidavit must be filed to substantiate any fact that is not a matter of record of the court. The fact in question being whether or not Capital One owns the debt. As a bank lawyer in a losing position, your job is to make your adversary begin to doubt their own argument. Keith will start off with a couple weak arguments just to see how versed we are on the subject. Keith starts by questioning whether or not the plaintiff is aware we are acting on their behalf. Then attempts to deny the plaintiff any representation by stating that he will only communicate with them directly. A blatant violation of the plaintiff's human rights. He then claims that they do not think that this payout arrangement is reasonable but he does not state why they believe this arrangement to be unreasonable. He then states that Capital One does not have to provide us with anything due to the fact that the plaintiff used the card, so that would prove that Capital One owns it. He then mentions that the Canadian rules of court that were referenced belong to the Supreme Court and not the Superior Court, where the Supreme Court is held high above the Superior Court. Obviously, these rules still apply. The plaintiff himself then reaches out to Keith to let him know that we are indeed his chosen representation and he may continue correspondence with us. He also lets Keith know that he is not seeking his legal advice, nor would he ever take the advice of an adversary's lawyer. He also lets Keith know that he's well aware of his human rights to choose his own representation and therefore Keith is obligated to correspond. We then begin to break down some of Keith's arguments for him. First of all, stating that the payout arrangement is unreasonable. So we go ahead and ask if he can state exactly why he believes it to be unreasonable due to the fact that the Capital One cardholder agreement states within it that they can sell at any time. This request is very reasonable. For Keith's second argument, stating that because the plaintiff used the card, that is proof that Capital One still maintains ownership of it, we bring his attention to the process of servicing a debt, where a bank may sell the rights to a contract, but continue to collect payments and then forward them to the rightful owner of the debt. This is called servicing, and it does not by any means verify that Capital One is entitled to a payment. The rightful owner of the rights to the contract would be entitled to a payment. Simply because Capital One is servicing the debt on the purchaser's behalf is not verifiable proof that Capital One still maintains ownership of the rights to the contract. They could simply be servicing the debt. We then let him know that Capital One's internal policy does not trump Canadian law. And regardless of Capital One's internal policy, they cannot collect money for assets that they do not own, as that would be considered fraud. Heath then attempts to use case law, where he references a prior case that he claims to be similar to our claim. Within the referenced case, one of the arguments made is the no value provided, money for nothing where the plaintiff says that the bank did not bring any money to the table. Therefore, that is the reason they are not obligated to make 
their payments. This is obviously very, very different from the argument that we are making. Nowhere within any of our correspondence nor statement of claim have we stated that we are not obligated to pay the debt because the bank did not bring any money to the table. We are simply asking the bank to provide verifiable proof of ownership so that we may forward funds to the rightful owner of it. Within this reference case, we also notice that within the conclusion, the judge grants a judgment in favor of the bank because they had provided affidavit evidence. In our case, Capital One has provided absolutely no affidavit evidence, as affidavit evidence is literally what we are requesting. This is another large discrepancy between the two claims. Keith is essentially trying to discredit our stance by putting arguments in our mouths that we never used. Another case that Keith references is Meads versus Meads, which I highly urge you to check out yourself as it is hilarious that Keith would claim that this has any parallels to what we are doing. In Meads versus Meads, Meads claims that he is not obligated to make his child support payments because he is a child of God. We then reach out and let Keith know that the reason that we are requesting such documentation is that if we were to forward the funds without seeing the proper documentation, then further down the line, someone else was able to provide the proper documentation, then that would leave everybody in a very compromising situation, which we have every right to do our best to avoid. We then let him know that we are going to be conducting a public investigation and creating short videos about this case and his conduct throughout. We then let him know that it is absolutely ridiculous to compare our case to Meads versus Meads or Bank of Montreal versus Roganinsky. We have not made any such claims such as money for nothing, nor being children of God. It is not suedo law that an entity cannot collect money for assets it does not own. We let him know that this case is very simple. A private lender is handing over a large sum of their hard-earned money to an institution for an asset, and they would simply like to verify they're handing funds over to the rightful owner of the aforementioned asset. We then ask him, why is it that that would be such a large problem? We then point out that the plaintiff is not attempting to eliminate his debt. He, along with the private lender, have been attempting to pay it out in full since March 7th, and that we are more than happy to pay the entire outstanding balance to whom it is lawfully owed. And as soon as he can prove that the debt is lawfully owed to Capital One, then we will forward the funds. The contract states very clearly that Capital One can sell it without informing anybody. If the debt has been sold, then simply point us to it has been sold to so we can continue this transaction with the rightful owner of the debt. It is extremely unreasonable to expect anyone to forward a lump sum of money to an entity which refuses to provide the documentation that confirms they are the rightful owner of it. The only way for us to confirm that Capital One still maintains ownership of the debt is by seeing the signed affidavit evidence from a chartered accountant that states that they checked the ledgers and the debt was not sold. That Keith will have to provide the affidavit anyways during mitigation to prove that Capital One is an affected party. Why not just provide it now so that we can pay the entire outstanding balance? Now, this next email is straight out of the unethical lawyer playbook. Once you begin losing and you can no longer defend your argument, you just simply refuse to speak to anybody. In this email, Keith attempts to further violate the plaintiff's human rights by refusing to speak to his chosen representation, all while refusing to answer any of the reasonable questions that have been put forth to him. He even goes as far as telling the plaintiff that he is not allowed to speak to us because we are not part of the law society. Now, obviously, that is absolutely garbage. What constitutes as unauthorized practice of law? That would be receiving money for legal services without a license. Unfortunately for Keith, United We Stand People is a volunteer human rights activist group that does not collect payment for our services. Therefore, Keith is obligated to speak to us. It seems as though Keith has realized that there is no defeating United We Stand People. Therefore, he will simply refuse to speak to us as to not further incriminate his client.
The correspondence finishes with an email from the plaintiff stating that United We Stand People is his chosen representation and they are acting on his behalf. United We Stand People are a volunteer human rights activist group and are not and do not need to be part of the law society to represent me. He asks Keith to please show us the rule that states that his representation must be a part of the law society. He then points out that Keith, acting as his adversary's lawyer, does not have the ability to tell him who he may or may not choose to represent himself, as that is his own basic human right. He then instructs Keith to please answer the reasonable questions that have been put forth to him. So there you have it. Keith Marlowe of Blake's law firm from Calgary, Alberta, is actively violating the human rights of those he goes against, as that is standard procedure for bank lawyers who cannot win their case without stripping the Canadian public of their basic human rights. So Keith needs to hear the public opinion on this matter. Keith needs to know that he is being watched and that the Canadian public will not stand for this. So, on the screen is Keith Marlowe's contact information. Feel free to send him an email as a concerned citizen regarding his conduct within this case. Or, if you'd like, feel free to give him a call and tell him exactly what your thoughts are.